The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 14521 in the name of Michael Russell on the Celtic Green Forest. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I call on Michael Russell to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful to the Parliament for cross-party support for my motion and for the chance to talk about and celebrate what is an important issue for Scotland. The word rain and its reality is depressingly familiar to people in Scotland at present, particularly after what has been officially the wettest December on record. But most people will be more familiar with the term rainforest in connection with places somewhat more exotic and somewhat warmer than Scotland. It's only recently, as the excellent new book on the rainforests of Britain by the Edinburgh-based environmentalist Clifton Blaine explains, mm -hmm. that our own temperate rainforests, which are often rare and threatened habitats, have achieved formal conservation status. Our rainforests support some of the oldest land plants on Earth, which appeared long before the dinosaurs. And the Celtic rainforests, which lie in our Atlantic coast, are also some of the most species-rich areas of plant and fungi, not only in the UK, but in the world. For example, in my own constituency, one of those forests, the one at Knapdale, is a rare and fertile treasure house, containing no less than 25% of all recorded types of Britain's mosses and liverworts. All along our northwestern coast, there are abundant, ancient, species-rich havens which are home to oak, ash and hazel woodlands, all packed with a plethora of colourful lichen, moss, ferns and fungi. The species that dot the forest floor and enjoy an epiphytic bond with the overhanging trees contain a joyous mix of names and uses, from yellow speckle belly to the stinky stitka to deceptive featherwort to the slender mouse tail moss. But I'm going to declare a favourite a thanks to the excellent and imaginative charity Plant Life. I am the species champion of the tree lungwort, a large and verdantly green lichen which can be found in several of the rainforests in Scotland. John Gerard first documented the medicinal use of tree lungwort in 1597, although his prescription of the lichen to treat lung disease, based solely upon its similar physical shape to a lung, might not be up to current diagnostic standards. More contemporary uses of the lichen included using extracts to treat the gastrointestinal system of rats. Now, I'm no lichenologist, I have to admit, and I'm no lichen, uh, lichenometrist either. Uh, a lichenometrist, presiding officer, as I'm sure you know, is one who calculates the age of rock by measuring the diameter of the lichen which covers it, something I don't think anybody in this chamber knew until this afternoon. But I do admit to being growingly aware of the rich variety of the lichens we have as our heritage here in Scotland, and particularly in the Celtic rainforests, and growingly concerned at the very real threats to them. And that's the primary reason why I've sought this debate, presiding officer, to draw attention to those threats, to inspire action from parliamentarians and government, and to celebrate the work that's being done already to protect and conserve them. There are two principal threats to our Celtic rainforests, and those are habitat fragmentation and the uh, intrusion of non-native invasive species, particularly Rhododendron ponticum. Rhododendron was introduced to the UK from the Iberian Peninsula in the late 18th century and supplemented by Himalayan imports thereafter. It spread far and wide and it threatens Celtic rainforests by its sheer vigour in what is an ideal habitat. It crowds out and overshades everything else. In recent years, SRDP funding has been vital in beating back the challenge and it's essential that that funding line continues. Great work has been done by bodies like Scottish Natural Heritage and the Forestry Commission to assess and combat the spread of rhododendron in key areas. Much of the actual work on the ground is being done by third sector bodies, community projects and volunteers. And it's crucial that we not only value their work, but give them the support they need and deserve. The need for more trained and supported volunteers is flagged as a key outcome in the Government's Challenge 2020 to de develop understanding and awareness of nature. The means of combating habitat fragmentation is less straightforward. Plant Life Scotland is doing a commendable job working to identify zones of opportunity where there is a proper environment for species growth, but where there are not yet present all the species which would be able to flourish in that environment. Plant Life is working with land managers and teams of volunteers to identify the zones and make plans for how to manage them to ensure species growth. The bigger the area, and especially the more contiguous areas there are in which Celtic rainforest species are able to grow, the more we can ensure long-term survival of this unique and vital habitat and all it contains. 
Presiding officer, the Celtic rainforest is the largest of Scotland's 43 important plant areas, the criteria for which were established in the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation. Plant Life has committed to provide effective management for 75% of Scotland's IPAs by 2020, and it's incumbent upon all of us as environmentally concerned citizens to do everything in our power to help achieve that task. As everyone here is aware, awakening interest and then converting interest into action is always a challenging task. Education is crucial, and we need to engage the widest possible audience. One way to do that is to ensure that we commend and celebrate those who are already hard at work. In that regard, it's good to see the John Muir Trust, Plant Life Scotland, the Ardroy Outdoor Centre Trust in my own constituency, the National Trust for Scotland and the Forestry Commission working together to create an award scheme which aims to recognise those who are building a deeper connection between people and groups of all ages and the outstanding natural environment in which we live and take our recreation. These organisations and many others work tirelessly to engage with communities, schools, families and landowners to build such connections, whilst undertaking the essential effective management of our wildness, our wilderness and our wetness, all parts of the archetypical Celtic rainforest. I'm sure the Minister will want to join with me in thanking them, and I look forward to hearing what more what she and the Scottish Government are doing to take the care and conservation of our Celtic rainforest forward. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes or so, and I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Jamie McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Celtic rainforests in Scotland are fantastically beautiful by their repute and globally significant, and we should consider ourselves lucky to play host to such an extraordinary variety of very rare species. I welcome the conservation efforts of the organisations which my colleague Mike Russell has already highlighted and stress the support that is needed by Scottish Government uh, and how important the awards are for plant life and uh, the National Trust for Scotland, Forestry Commission Scotland and the John Muir Trust and the Ardroy Outdoor Education Centre Trust, which my colleague Mike Russell uh, knows uh, about, I'm sure. Um, also, the Heritage Lottery Fund is important in this context and, of course, um, the, the backing of Scottish Natural Heritage. Um, and I would particularly like to thank my colleague uh, Mike Russell for his motion uh, to highlight this important uh, issue. A number of my constituents in South Scotland have raised their concerns about the issue of deforestation to me recently, and the loss of much of our native woodland due, is due to human impact and the changing climate, which is indeed a tragedy, and we must address this as parliamentarians. The Celtic rainforests ignite the imagination. For those who haven't visited, myself being one, uh, the, the names alone paint a picture of this otherworldly habitat. You could pluck Pucks Glen and explore, you could explore, explore Pucks Glen or go on a hunt for blackberries and custard or octopus suckers, I understand. And I'm certainly now looking for, um, forward to a visit, perhaps um, over the summer recess, if I'm still here indeed. <laughs> um, the balance of heavy rain and mild temperatures create a vivid environment which is very humid and that is able to nurture the lichens, mosses, liverworts, fungi and ferns which in turn help to maintain the humidity. Rarer than tropical rainforests, these ecosystems are an invaluable contribution to our biodiversity, supporting migratory birds and ancient flora and fauna. And the RSPB informed me that though Scotland accounts for only 0.05% of the world's land area, it is home to 5% of moss species, calling it a global moss hotspot. The aforementioned uh, uh, environmental organisations have laid out positive steps for protecting these habitats and as Mike Russell has highlighted rhododendron ponticum though attractive spreads at a forceful rate and having tried to pull out quite a lot of it as a volunteer myself it, it is quite a challenge and people the volunteers should be commended who do this work um, we need long-term plans to tackle this and other invasive species and I welcome the control initiatives being worked on by the RSPB and plant life and I'm also pleased to see discussions of more effective deer management mechanisms and hope that the land reform bill will assist in this problem of overgrazing. Further difficulties can result from fragmentation. 
Small islands of habitat are far more vulnerable to weather disturbances and disease, and networks need to be built up. We have a responsibility to acknowledge that our activities mean these habitats may not be able to sustain themselves as they once could. In my own region of South Scotland is the Maybe Forest, where the species I champion, the forest moth, resides in dappled sunlight and moist open areas. This is a good example of habitat like the Celtic rainforests, which need careful management. I am pleased to lend my, my uh, support to raising awareness of these issues and echo the call of schools, community businesses, communities, businesses and local authorities to engage supportively in conservation work for the Celtic rainforests and right across Scotland. I am inspired also by the Girvin Nectar Network, an exemplary initiative on the Ayrshire coast tackling the issue of fragmentation for pollinators and the cooperation of, of local people and businesses and the local authority has made this something that could be rolled out across Scotland, I believe. As Shadow Minister for Environmental Justice, I'm delighted to see foresters, land managers and conservationists working together to preserve our Scottish rainforests. The Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh has developed an innovative programme to calculate how best to manage a habitat within the big picture of climate change. Looking to the year 2080, where some of us anyway won't be here, I suppose, the tool can, can be used by forest managers to consider different development ideas. With a cooperative and science-based approach, these environments will thrive long beyond that, I hope, and won't be reduced simply to a myth. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Jamie McGregor to be followed by Rob Gibson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too congratulate um, Mike Russell on securing this member's debate, and I also thank Plant Life Scotland for their very useful briefing. Um, as they suggest, this, the Celtic rainforest, that is the temperate woodland found along Scotland's Atlantic coast, and based on sessile oak, downy birch and hazel, is often overlooked. Indeed, I suspect a number of members were quite surprised to hear Scotland does actually have its own rainforests, um, albeit ones that are certainly not tropical. Um, but they are an important and globally rare natural resource and are valuable for the diversity of species they support, including the rare mosses, liververts uh, uh, and lichens to which Mike Russell has referred. Um, and I'm told that a typical forest ravine in Argyll can contain as many as 200 species of mosses and liververt, and he mentioned the specific woodland in Knapdale, which has 25% of Britain's entire mosses and liververts, including a species which I don't think he mentioned, known as the prickly featherwort, um, and rare filmy ferns, which are so called because of their translucent looking fawns. It's no wonder that the Celtic rainforest has been described as a lichenologist's mecca. I hope we can encourage more lichenologists and lovers of rare plant species to visit our Celtic rainforest as, as this extra wildlife tourism could be a welcome boost to local economies in the countryside. I remember once visiting a rainforest in New Zealand and eating part of a cabbage tree. And I don't know what bush tucker can be found in Scotland's um, rainforest, but I'm told by my eldest daughter, Sibylla, that the wild garlic does make very good pesto. Uh, the motion refers to the impact of the invasive rhododendron ponticum. I do agree with that. Indeed, I've spoken about the effect of invasive non native species such as this on a number of occasions in this chamber. My late father, Charles McGregor, was an expert collector of ro hybrid rhododendrons, and I readily accept that they produce wonderful, colourful blooms in botanic and private gardens. Um, rhododendron and azalea gardens in Argyll in May are something to behold in their magnificence. But unchecked in the wild, ponticum can spread readily and snuff out other plant species in their wake, um, as can Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam as well. And we need to see sustained action to, spread that, uh, to, to prevent the spread, harming our biodiversity. And I would commend SNH for their continued good work in this regard. Um, and I hope that the SRDP grants will continue um, in, in order to help volunteers and others 
uh, take care of looking after our biodiversity in this way. Um, the spread of Rhododendron ponticum is a great threat to our Atlantic woodlands. Now I join Mike Ross and others in welcoming the efforts of organizations to educate young people about the forests in their communities, and I would encourage constituents to consider supporting schemes such as the Flora Guardian, where individuals can volunteer to help monitor and conserve some of the special plants in our woodlands. Um, one note of caution to them, if you're visiting a Celtic rainforest in summer, be sure to take a midge net with you. Um, these woodlands also are useful because they give shelter to roe deer, red deer, sheep, and many native and migratory birds, such as the woodcock, which comes in the winter in particular. And uh, to conclude, presiding officer, I again welcome today's debate and hope that it will help raise awareness of and understanding of the important Celtic forest habitat that we're fortunate enough to have in Argyle and in the West Highlands generally, and whose long-term future we should all be aiming to secure. It's been there through changing centuries, and I hope it will be there for many more to come. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. I think that Mike Russell is due uh, considerable congratulations on bringing this important debate to the Chamber here. Uh, at the beginning of a year where climate change is in many people's minds, uh, the issues that affect the Celtic rainforest, which stretch from the far north of my constituency at Loch Erebel uh, down to uh, his own in Argyle, is one of the treasures of our country for various reasons, because it's a barometer, it's a thermometer, it's the kind of measure about the way in which our natural habitats on the edge of the Atlantic are actually coping with the kinds of weather that we face. The Celtic rainforest uh, at Ardvar uh, in Assent was one of the reasons why our, uh, the RACI uh, committee got involved in one of the problems that face uh, such uh, of the Celtic woodlands we're discussing today. Ardvar at about 58 degrees 25 north and around 805 uh, hectares is an area of uh, complex woods, old sessile oak, birch, and uh, birch dominated with oak in uh, that area along with Loch Avulan. But the problem is that uh, for many of these areas, the, pro the issues about the way in which they're managed will allow us to see whether they are regenerating or not. And there's broadleaf deciduous woodlands in 32% of Ardvar and about heath and scrub, etc., in 33%. I have seen with my own eyes that there should be a lot more of the deciduous trees and a lot less scrub because of overgrazing. Uh, SNH is a partner in the Celtic rainforest approach. Now, it does so as a lead body to advise the government, and I see that there are many other uh, partners in this. And I wonder whether, in fact, they uh, have a handle on whether the John Muir Trust, one of the partners, actually has policies about deer culling that will aid the recovery of uh, the Celtic uh, rainforest or not. And I've been very worried to read uh, issues about the way in which their culling policy has left deer on the side of the hill and uh, not actually taking it off the hills. And I'd like to know whether SNH actually feels that that's a good way for the John Muir Trust to, to behave. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say, we also have a problem about whether or, or not the local uh, estates next to where the John Muir Trust are in Assent, near Ardvar, actually can manage their deer because there are suggestions that there's very deep culling, but which uh, the public does not know the detail. So the question about the Celtic rainforests being able to uh, regenerate does allow us to question whether all the partners are doing their best to do so, because the Ardvar example was what led to the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee uh, investigating deer management across Scotland, and it led to ministerial intervention to protect our native woodlands like the Celtic rainforest. So the debate which we're having today does allow us to see 
this in a considerable context. It is very important. The, the RSPB has suggested to us that the Celtic rainforest is under real and present threat, one of which is the wrong levels of grazing. And that is why I brought this subject to the centre of my remarks just now. So the production of the strategic local deer management plans, which is widely seen as a positive step in protecting native habitats from overgrazing, is an absolute essential for the Celtic rainforest in the future. Presiding officer, I have sat at the exposed point of, <coughs> of slate in the Isle of Skye, where six-inch high oaks nestle in the heather, stunted by the prevailing gales and by overgrazing pressure. There are many more potential Celtic rainforests out there if we get the balance between tree growth and deer management correct. And I think that's why we've got to celebrate and encourage the conservation of the Celtic rainforests as Mike Russell proposes. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. And can I now invite Aileen McLeod to respond to the debate. Minister, seven minutes or so, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by also uh, adding my thanks to my colleague uh, Michael Russell for bringing this motion on the Celtic rainforests to the Chamber this evening for debate. I share his enthusiasm for this important part of Scotland's natural environment, and I am especially grateful to the other members who have taken part in this evening's debate for their support. Now, as we've heard this evening, Presiding Officer, the Celtic rainforest thrives on rainy and misty conditions, high humidity and minimal fluctuations in temperature. And that creates you know, an important habitat consisting of numerous common and rare species of mosses, liverworts and lichens. And there are an exceptional number of plants growing on or hanging from trees and the ground is often ankle deep in a blanket of mosses and liverworts. And obviously, as a, Michael Russell has already mentioned, as a Scottish Environment Link MSP, a species champion, uh, he has already lent his support to the tree lungwort, a green leafy lichen that grows in Scotland's woodland along the west coast. And I do not think it is an exaggeration to highlight the international importance of the Celtic uh, rainforest. And as members have highlighted, as well as it being a habitat for these mosses, uh, liverworts, and a rich array of lichens. It also provides homes uh, to many rare and important fauna, such as the pied flycatcher and the checkered uh, skipper butterfly. And the Celtic rainforests, you know, they may not be as well known as, for example, the tropical rainforests of Amazonia. So I'm really pleased that we've had this debate in the chamber this evening so we can actually recognise, you know, their real genuine value and to be able to explore opportunities for their enhancement. Now, although the rainforest stretches along much of our Atlantic coast, Argyll is, of course, the heartland of Celtic rainforest in Scotland, with many iconic sites such as Glen Crerin, Glen Nant, and the western shore of Loch Awe. We should not also uh, forget, and I know some members have already mentioned this, about the cultural and the tourism importance of these forests. And it should be absolutely no surprise that the forests attract visitors from far afield who come to enjoy our ancient green scenery and the incredible wildlife. A recent publication uh, by Clifton Bain, The Rainforests of Britain and Ireland, A Traveller's Guide, you know, that also highlights you know, the very uniqueness of these habitats and encourages people uh, to explore these spectacular lush woodlands and to understand their value to the environment and to society. Now, as Mike Russell and others have pointed out, unfortunately, there are threats to these iconic forests. In particular, are invasive and non-native plants, browsing pressure and climate change. But there is uh, good news, uh, presenting officer. I can't tell you how much I need good news right now. But actions are being undertaken uh, to protect and improve the condition of this habitat. And that can only be fully effective with coordinated uh, effort and that long-term commitment from a wide range of organisations. And the Forestry Commission Scotland, for example, is finalising uh, the national strategy uh, for rhododendron control that encourages landscape scale uh, partnership work, uh, specifically within uh, designated sites. And that will be sometime in the spring. Uh, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds and Plant Life Scotland are also working extremely hard to develop a project to restore Atlantic woodland, which includes the removal of rhododendron 
and that will focus on four special areas of conservation in Scotland, Onig to the North Balakulish Woods, the Morven Woods, Sunert and the Loch Lomond Woods. And on the National Forest Estate, you know, the expansion of the Celtic Celtic rainforest is being achieved by the efforts of Forest Enterprise Scotland through removing the non-native trees from plantations on ancient woodland sites. And I understand that there are plans for up to 40 sites to be cleared over the next two years, including you know, a large area of spruce in Knapdale Forest. Forestry Commission Scotland's Native Woodland Survey of Scotland uh, recorded uh, that a high level of grazing by deer and sheep contributes to the poor condition of many woodland habitats, including uh, the Celtic rainforest. And I take the points that have been uh, raised uh, specifically by uh, Rob Gibson in this regard in terms of our deer management. But as Mr Gibson is aware, our deer management is always an issue uh, that we are uh, taking forward in the land reform uh, bill. Now, under the Scottish Government's uh, biodiversity route map to 2020, one of the areas that we aim to focus effort is on the reduction uh, of browsing pressure, given how special Jamie McGregor. Uh, just on that point, um, I know um, overgrazing has been mentioned here with sheep and deer. Um, is, is there going to be a formula to work out what a sensible grazing level is? Minister? Well, obviously this is going to be part and parcel of some of the provisions that we're looking at in relation to the Land Reform Bill. Um, but as I say, this is, you know, in terms of, you know, the Scottish Government's, as I said, the Scottish Government's biodiversity uh, route map to 2020, I mean, one of the areas that we are aiming to focus our effort is on, is on specifically on the reduction of that browsing pressure because we know how special our Celtic rainforests are, so they need to be uh, protected uh, properly. Now, one project uh, has already been mentioned around the secrets of the Celtic rainforest was managed by Plant Life Scotland, and that is working uh, with the land managers and communities across Scotland's west coast to deliver uh, the improved condition of woodland. And that work is to be uh, commended. I'd also like to put on record my thanks to Plant Life Scotland for their very helpful briefing uh, that they provided for this evening's uh, debate. On designated sites, uh, of which there are many within the Celtic rainforest, grant support is available uh, under the current Scotland's uh, Rural Development Programme, demonstrating our commitment to protecting and improving important habitats in Scotland. Obviously, in the longer term, the climate change induced pressure may pose other threats, and the research is indicating the potential for the future loss of biodiversity and species in these Atlantic woodlands is high. Now, the smaller and the more isolated the woodland, then the more vulnerable it is to these losses. And that's why we are helping these forests to adapt to future changes through actions which encourage regeneration and expansion, and so will build that greater resilience and adaptability. Now, all of this work is part of the Scottish Government's prioritised plan for meeting uh, the international uh, targets in a route map to 2020. So, in closing, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, can I thank uh, Michael Russell again for bringing this motion, a very important motion, I think, on the Celtic rainforest to the Chamber uh, this evening. I very much welcome the considerable attention that's given to these important habitats. I support the motion, uh, absolutely, and recognising you know, the importance of this woodland and the threats uh, that it faces. And I certainly commend the efforts uh, of all of those involved and all of our volunteers in its conservation. I am particularly pleased to learn that groups such as the Ardroy Education Centre Trust are helping uh, to engage and educate local school children and communities because education in this regard is so crucial and indeed you know, just embedding that understanding and awareness of such important places with local communities and young people you know, is something that's very close uh, to my own heart. So, presenting officer, these are truly special places. They deserve special care and conservation and management and providing you know, a link, a living link to our natural and cultural heritage. And I think we must all do our utmost to ensure that they are protected properly so that we can secure uh, the long-term future uh, as my colleague Jamie McGregor also said in his, uh, rem in his remarks, and to encourage more people to visit our Celtic rainforests, which are magnificent and very unique. So thank you very much. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes Michael Russell's debate on Celtic rainforest. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>